University of Calcutta. To give today's uh, lecture in our series, we're very, very glad to have you here. Um, uh, Dr. Sanyal has a background in anthropology and then he switched to archaeology. In any case, anthropology and archaeology are very close. In many, many universities, they talk together. And he's conducted a number of excavations in different parts of Eastern India primarily. Um, and has had many fellowships, uh, postdoctoral fellowships, uh, fellowships of the Indian Council of uh, Historical Studies, um, and several postdoctoral fellowships. He's currently assistant professor at the University of Calcutta, Calcutta in the uh, Department of Archaeology. So, it's a very warm welcome to Dr. Sanya. We look forward to his talk. I know a lot of students and faculty are interested in, in archaeology, so it's particularly uh, Nice to have you here today, and we look forward to your talk and a discussion. So please welcome. Thank you. 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 This is of the monastic side. And standing here at the Nalanda University, I think this would be the most, most relevant thing of talking on an excavated site of, of a Buddhist monastic excavated site from West Bengal. But before getting into the slides, which actually reveals with the excavation things, let me introduce the theme. It's actually an excavated site in southwest and West Bengal, which we started excavating in 2004 with my late Lamentech teacher, Professor Ashok Dokto as director, as a chef and myself. This was rediscovered, this site, this mound, the entire village is a top of my mound, I'll discuss in detail with the slides. This was rediscovered in 1999, after it was mentioned way back in 1992 by a local historian, Enan Vasu, one of the most uh, prominent national historians of that time. He mentioned this in the course of his exploration work in the Mayurbhut area since this was, this region is contiguous to the uh, northern Orissa coast. And he introduced this mound with uh, the comment that this might be a medieval mound of uh, some local Manja kings of Orissa, some of the branches of the Manja rulers. Then it was accidentally rediscovered by my teacher in 1999 when they were travelling in that area in course of a different project on maritime history of, of Eastern India. And then we, the department decided to excavate this site because this area where this site is located is called Tantum. The name of the area where this site is located is called Dantan. In 7th century inscriptions of Bengal, Western Bengal, we have a set of copper plate inscriptions of Bengal which talk of a province in Bengal, in the southwestern part of the delta, which is Dandabukti. Bukti, as we all know, its province. And scholars from 1960s at least, they believed almost generally that Dantum is the correct counterpart of ancient Dandam. At least on the ground of phonetic similarity, some scholars suggested there is a clear linguistic similarity connection, but this is debated. At least phonetic affinity is there with Dantum and Dantum. And several explorations were carried out by local historians in this area who reported sculptures, pottery, some mounds, but no specific chronology, archaeological chronology of the region was known until this site was excavated. So, with a view to understand the nature of settlement apart from new light, if possible, to draw on the identification of Dandabukti, 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 and Dandabukti, because this site, Mughalmari, it lies within the police station of Dandabukti. This site lies at Dantum, just 4 kilometers from the township. 
this is the map of southwestern Bengal where you have the site and here is now which is usually identified with Dardar Mukti. So our primary aim was to situate the Mughal Mughal remains if possible in the con context of ancient Dardar Mukti or if uh, identification is can be archaeologically corroborated. This was the major goal. With this we started an exploration in the area and at the village we came across in the house of one of the school teachers of the village this votive tablet which clearly records the so called Buddhist creed or the Dharmakarya in a script which is not later than 5th, 6th century and most importantly the script is of course not Eastern Indian kind of script so it somehow came to the area from some other region and then also this thing was found from the exploration this had an Eastern Indian script called Siddhamatrika it also records the Buddhist Dharmapariya written in 7th 8th century script these were clear indicators that some Buddhist remains are there below this mountain Actually, the entire Mughalbari village, this entire village is actually located atop a single mound which has been dissected into uh, several sectors of modern habitation. This is the plan of the site. These are the water bodies, this is the cultivated, cultivated land. These two are the major areas where they excavated, of which this is the mound, the surface mound which is still intact. Other things are on, uh, these are the, the locations, we named them as MGM1, MGM2 and then another location close to MGM2 called MGM3, we named them uh, such as this and apart from MGM1, these two are not clear mounds, these are surface uh, sites but excavations were quite rewarding as I this is the mound, excavation of the, this is the mound, it's a 60 meter by 60 meter mound quite extensive, strewn with bricks throughout and we started excavating in 2004 from the center of the mound the first year's result was the discovery of a square platform this portion, this platform, along with A structural remain which had regular projections which you call in architectural terms three other projections or projection had a structure having three projections this is this this one and then it's common and this one and it goes like this this becomes a three other structure having three projections on all sides this was part of our three other structure that was found in the very first year. The detail of the same three of the structure with recess. Below this structural layer of the three of the or three projection structure, we found an earlier structural phase just below that earlier below that structure, after a gap of about 1.5 meter we came across this structural layer unfortunately still now we do not have proper idea of the nature of this structural phase I will discuss the reason later on then we started from 2007 onwards we started laying out, laying out trenches at the center of the moon and results were some a set of archaeological evidences of a monastic site starting from cells, the monastic cells. And then in 2008 we came to notice that these cells were built at least at two successive stages, phases of construction. This is the original phase of the monastery when it was first built talk about the time later on and this is the second phase 
the intermediate phase is of course badly disturbed. Then we found towards the eastern part of the mound, if for your convenience I draw a north line here along this area. Eastern border, we found this outer wall of a building having this plinth of nearly three meters, which was the outer wall of a structure within which those cells were found. This is the plinth. All along, all through, uh, plastered with stuff. And then, in 2007, from one of the niches, you can see several niches here. These are the badly disturbed niches. In one of which we found the sculpture, stack of sculpture of a figure, which is not quite clear, but at least the portion of a lotus pedestal and stand and a human figure with a hand, uh, one of the, yes the left hand uh, can be detected. It's a detail of the same thing. And then your deep digging, we came across this detail of, the details of decorations along the wall of the plane. These are the decorated motifs which are in stack oil. Discuss what stack oil actually is. These are the decorated motifs that was found to cover the entire monastic wall for a length of, which as we exposed, for a length of about 20 meters throughout the these stack oil elements. But before getting into any further detail, let me explain what stacco actually is. Stacco is a mixture of lime, gypsum, uh, sand, and marble dust. Gypsum is not always used, but sometimes local view and other things are used. But the lime is of course extracted from the shells, these mollusks. We also found the evidence of that from the cycle company. And the most interesting thing at the site was the entire monastic wall, this eastern wall, sorry, this wall, well, this eastern wall, we found this uh, plinth decorated with different types of design bricks, which were set to give a very very elevation to the uh, face of the wall. These bricks were colored with red ochre, the face of the bricks, and then following the same design, the thing was plastered with stuff. This also has an implication. We come to that. And apart from those smaller niches to the north of the site from that area where we will have the entrance later on. In this area we have these larger niches on both the sides. This is one of those larger niches to the north of the site. And then you have the regular monastic features, the train plastered again with stucco, the scoop of basement, and possibly the part of the sand. This portion is black, badly plundered. There are British reports that thousands of bricks were carried from this site while uh, uh, constructing this road of Rajkar and Odisha. The regular plundering occurred at the site. So, uh, at least from the sanctum area, we didn't, couldn't recover any artifact because it was badly disturbed and devastated. 
And at the center of the mound, we came across this stucco plastered, lime plastered floor. We took trial trenches as, at various points and could con trace the continuity of this throughout the central area. Throughout this area. And the cells, if you see the entire plan, the cells are as usual along the periphery of the central courtyard. This is part of the courtyard. This is the slide of the most deep section at the site where you can have a, a general idea of how the river of the flood deposits played a very crucial role in post-depositional activities at the site. Because the river on which this site is located, which is now about 8 kilometers from the site, of course it was quite close to the site, about 1400 years back. And uh, these sections clearly show the retreat of sand deposits after different genres of flood catastrophic or nuisance floods. So these are mostly, these are safe deposits. You have actual cultural debris from this layer 7. And then the usual monastic artifacts like stone images, stucco figures which are fallen off their context across this, along this wall, this eastern wall. And then, in 2011, we shifted our excavation to this portion, this area. Carried out excavation along the western border of the eastern border. Then, we came across an undisturbed wall, unlike that eastern wall, thoroughly decorative with these stucco images, which were actually also there on the eastern wall, but lost unfortunately. But here, the images are there. Please see this wall. I'll discuss this later on, its implication. These are the stucco images that were found along the western wall of the monastery. Okay, let's keep this and come back to this. These are the life size stucco images that were excavated from the wall, from the plinth of the western wall. These are well known Buddhist and uh, general themes image of Kobe, a gun, dancing couple. At least 15 such images were recovered from the wall. And this is the damaged eastern wall and this is the intact western wall. Where you can see this is the damaged uh, pilaster of the niche and here you have an almost intact niche at the western wall. You can compare the two things and uh, see how and these are the these are the cells just inside the internal uh, part of the uh, wall. Now this is the monastery, the eastern monastery at the eastern part. I say that we first excavated this portion and then this one and in between the internal parts and also the northern portion from where the, we uh, the evidence of the gateway. But this final plan shows that apart from this main monastery, with at least those two structural phases of which we had the cells, there was a third thing there, which was a different monastery. Actually, this monastery is a second complex within the premise of a common wall. We could excavate in the first year remains of the second monastery, the platforms of the actually the third monastery at the uppermost level. And then 
from 2007 onwards, we concentrated in this area and found evidence of the earlier part. Actually, it's a total complex within this wall, this is the boundary wall, of which the eastern wall of the monastery forms the common wall for the entire complex as well as this monastery itself. And here comes the implication of this wall. Actually, this is the supporting wall after this mound was reoccupied by the inhabitants of the second monastery. They built a new smaller monastery over there and tried to restore the earlier one by placing supporting walls at regular intervals. This is the evidence of one of them, of which the lower level is lost. Only the four or five courses of bricks are remaining at the upper layer. These were placed between these two complexes in order to buttress the devastated and disturbed and lost wall of the earlier phase. And this host wall is a clear evidence of the loss of the earlier phase. This is called a host wall where you don't have the actual material at some of the portions of the entire structure and then you have the same thing uh, after a gap. The material in between is lost. So it's a rubber strange and this portion, this stacco plastered portion, it's a ghost. It of course took place in historical period at one or some other point of time. And apart from these things, the specific uh, date markers of the monastery, <coughs> among these markers was this clay tablet. We came across a large number of clay tablets from these sites. And with usual Buddhist motifs, although this particular tablet is not as usual as we might think, because this is a type with a Buddhist pendant, Buddha sitting in Madrasan at the center enshrined with his with the Bodhisattvas flanking the central figure. This and stupas all around, you can see, two rows of stupas and here also wherever they found some place, they placed a stupa over there. So, apart from the usual Buddhist motifs, we have an inscription between the rows of stupas and the rows of the figures. Here is the inscription. If you see this at least one of the specimens, this is the specimen we came across already with the 19 such tablets in two years of excavation in 2011 and 12. Here you can clearly read the Buddhist Dhanabhaya. The most important thing is excuse me, the script is not later than 5th century or 6th century BC. Earlier we were thinking, depending on the nature of stylistic evidence of the stuff images, that it should date to 7th century. But the discovery of this thing, we were certain that this is at least a 6th century if not a 6th century monastery, if not earlier than that. This is a second category of evidence where you have seated Buddha flank by again two sets of bodhisattvas, the pentad, and seated Buddhas here, transcendent figures, and in between the inscription. And in the third category, you have a central stoop. This Type is quite common in southeastern, uh, Southeast Asia, particularly central Java. Uh, recent excavations at two of the sites by my two friends, Indonesian friends and French friends, they have revealed from two sites uh, called Patujaya and Umanya. Uh, from these two sites, they have excavated similar kind of, uh, typologically at least, at least typologically similar kind of uh, terracotta clay tablets. And they are also rated to serve not uh, later than 8th century. And these are some of the decorative elements in stucco which actually originally adorned the wall of the monastery but are completely lost because stucco is a highly fragile environment. And some of the 
large number of large uh, huge range of types of decorated bricks from the site. We have to write a separate chapter in our internal report on design bricks uh, after excavating the site because of these large number of uh, design types. These are of course made of mold. And the final product product might have been might have had some role of uh, manual uh, craftsmanship, but actually the uh, core was of course made from uh, mold. And these are the pottery. I think in tomorrow's class we'll be able to see some original pottery I have with me from the site. Uh, and some stone sculptures. While at Mohanmari we have large number of statue images, stone sculptures are surprisingly lesser now, as we are discussing it. Right? So, although we have one inscribed person, I don't think in this presentation we have this, no, I don't have that one. So we have an inscribed thing that is far, far later, uh, a written in script of not earlier than 11th century, at least uh, possibly 11th or 12th century old script, but uh, that was at the fag end of the establishment of the monastery, the site, from that area. And these are general artifacts, monastic artifacts, the lamps, uh, hopscotches, some iron nails, and we found a hoard of cowrie shells. And at MGM2, as I showed in the initial slide, there were two locations. This was the second location, MGM2. The major discovery was a set of three stupas, stupa basements. These were, of course, what you stupas. We even excavated at the center of one of the uh, supers, but nothing was found. But interesting is this part. We conducted a deep dig here for uh, just reconstructing the stratigraphy of the ocean. And here, from layer 5 onwards, we came across a deposit of came across a deposit of 1.5 meter thick occupation containing black and red ware, which is a proto-historic pottery and dates back to at least middle of the second millennium BC. This monastic site started at at least 5th century BC, but this should be dated to at least 15th century BC. Unfortunately, now we don't have any C14 date from the site because initially we had readily datable materials from the site, so we didn't bother to uh, take the things. <coughs> and now, since the site has been recently protected by the state government, they are estimating the site, so we don't have, don't have any further scope to date materials. But from the pottery themselves, we can say without any hesitation that these are dated to at least middle of the second millennium BC, if not earlier than that. So, occupation at the site started in the second millennium BC, then there might have been a gap. Though now we are, that we are preparing the final report if, and we are examining the pottery, we find some clear affinity of uh, early historic types from the center of the main mound in Gym 1. But that is uh, still dated. If at least after Chalcolithic, the site was reoccupied by the uh, monastic people around 15th century BC is clear from excursion at this end. And this is one of the weird assemblages in situ. And close to that place, MGM2, if you remember that site plan uh, towards the northwest, we excavated at the third point, but we named it MGM3 later on, which will come out in the final report. This map was from the uh, interim report only when, when it was not even digitalized. From this area, we came across again datable materials of inscribed clay tablets, tablets, but these were datable to a slightly later period of 9th, 10th century. And some from this portion, from the lowermost part, we found some uh, assemblages made of iron, which are, of course, medieval material. And below that, we have this. 19th century uh, deposit, mostly in the form of pottery and two or three stray finds of these 
inscribed materials. So, this is the story of this site. We could not corroborate the evidence of Dandavati. But of course, after the discovery of two monastic sites in West Bengal, one at its northern border and the other one in the middle of the mid Bhagirathi plain, we have the first evidence of a monastic complex in southwestern Bengal in this part. Secondly, its uh, bottom line, its lower line stuff confirms to the date of the inscription which are found from the region and which talk of ancient province of Dandamurti. So, of course, the settlement had close connection with that uh, particular administrative division. If we accept this proposal of phonetic connection between Dandamurti and Nandam. And finally, this so far is the earliest Buddhist monastic site excavated from West Bengal. These three are so far the uh, most significant things with this monastic site. That's all. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, it would be nice. He also has a brief presentation on the settlement area, some of the settlement sites around it. We can go through that also in the next 10 15 minutes. Because I think we have only. Yeah, you have. Yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. this is a completely different thing, which is not related to. Uh, telling us about the site that you have excavated over the last 10 years.